60 billion dollars. That's how much agricultural industry loses to plant diseases every year. Plant viruses are the second greatest contributor to these yield losses. One of the viruses is smallpox virus. First observed in plums in Bulgaria around 1992, this virus now devastates stone food worldwide. Plums, peaches, nectarines, fluox, cherries, almonds, these are your premier species stone fruit. The disease is marked by symptoms such as misshapen and discolored fruit, which the average shopper would eschew. Not to mention that here in the US, if an infected tree is found in the orchard, all trees within a 50 meter radius must be bulldozed and incinerated. But it's no surprise that smallpox has a huge economic impact, upwards of $10 billion in cost of disease management thus far, and the loss of income of those directly involved with affected orchards, as well as indirect market losses like the disruption of local and national economies. This is further exacerbated by the fact that smallpox poses such a serious threat that all susceptible species, including ornamentals like cherry blossoms or plum blossoms, are subject to disease management strategies as well. Like other RNA viruses, including the SARS-CoV-2, smallpox persists in the form of a quasi-species, a population where progeny genomes differ from the parent by at least one nucleotide. We wanted to study smallpox viral dynamics because so far in nature, there are at least 10 strains of plumpox virus. Most of them are due to variation, due to the error-prone polymerase, and some are due to recombination between co-infecting isolates and strains. New strain appearances are generally associated with enhanced virus infection, spread, or adaptation to new hosts, vectors, and environment. Sounds familiar? The perennial nature of stone fruit allows PPV to persist from year to year, affording the opportunity for variants to appear and be potentially maintained. To investigate PPV variant dynamics, we analyzed NTS data generated from ribosome associated with RNA, which are likely being translated and thus actively contributing to the infection process. RNA was isolated from infected plum leaves at two, for six and 12 weeks post leaf emergence during two separate growth periods. Blood samples were collected pre and post stimulated dormancy or cold and boost dormancy. But the most interesting thing within our methods is the generation of transgenic plants, which express black tag ribosoma protein LAT driven by either the phloem-specific sucrose 2 promoter or the near constitutive 35S promoter, as you can see in figure one. And again, over the two growth periods, we collected samples as depicted in figure two. We extracted RNA from our translatome and sequenced them with gen gene lists and got back 59 output libraries which I analyzed using the CLC genomics workbench. And that bar reads to a reference genome of PPV PEM7 and isolated variants such that only variants with a coverage of at least 10 and appearing in at least two reads would be accounted for. If you look at figure three, you see that PPV translation levels were consistent with expected viral infection levels going from low at two weeks to peaking at either six or four weeks and going down during the bud phase. We also see that there is a difference between the tissues at the 12 week time point where PPV levels differ between whole leaf and phloem tissue. In auto 12 week leaves, the PVE level associated with the phloem translatum is significantly reduced compared to that in whole tissue translatum for both growing periods. This indicates that there's a tissue specific variation in virus levels. Next, we show that there, the PVE population is proportionally more diverse in younger tissue, as you can see in figure four. Diversity in buds was 
wholly greater than diversity in any of the leaf tissues, particularly the mature tissues. In figure five, we were able to show that PV variant levels display dynamic changes throughout the growth cycle. There's A, B, C, e, and D. All of these are the individual variants over assembling periods from one PPV infected transplatum tree. Group one depicted in figure five at A are those that are the consensus sequence. They most likely present the majority of leaves present. Whereas we have more dynamic variants that have varying frequencies and may be less able to compete with the consensus sequence variants. And then we have the four, which is in figure 5B. These are not able to compete as well and only appear once or twice or due to the lack of lines. We also saw that, the, that there was a tissue related distribution of identified PPV variants. If you look at table two, you'll see that although most of the variants, although most of the group one, two, and three variants are in the shared column or shared between both the sucrose two and the P35S or the foam and whole leaf transplatums, there do appear to be more variants that are present in the foam only compared to in whole tissue only. Thus, we're able to say that there might be foam-specific variants of the palm pox virus. And whether they're advantageous to the virus is yet to be discovered. And finally, I'd like to conclude as such, a short summary. First, we can see that the system that we use where we doubly tag the ribosomal protein, ribosomal protein L18, is such a system that allows for tissue-specific observation of molecular patterns. We also found that tissue and developmental stage impact the levels and diversity of PPV, as we could see in buds and mature tissue. Buds are likely a uniquely a unique environment for the maintenance of variants from one growing season to the next, which is why we see more diversity in buds compared to others. Additionally, we found that differentially regulated genes not pictured that are differentially regulated in leaf tissue were not differentially regulated in buds. These genes are associated with defense against viruses. Thus, it might be that in buds, these RNAi defenses are not actively selecting the population of the virus. Also, the low quantity of virus might also decrease selection pressure of super exclusion superinfection exclusion, which is a phenomenon where a pre-existing infection prevents the secondary infection of another closely or related, another closely related genome. We also found that individual variants can be placed into four distinct groups based on their frequency maintenance during the sampling period. Finally, we found that there may exist specific PP variants with yet to be discovered advantages. Combined, these results indicate that the PPV population dynamics are impacted by tissue type and developmental stage of their host, and that there are tentatively, tentatively advantageous clone specific variants. And with that, I'd like to thank you. Mm, yeah. Mm, thank you.